I'm going to call this zero because I don't want to deal with any more complexity. Let's say you have this, but it starts at 5 and ends at 10. Okay, right? It starts out at 5 and then sometime the call called zero jumps up to 10. <coughs> then mu of s is 5 over s. 5 because that's the difference between where it starts and where it goes at the end. You'll see this many, many times, okay? Again, it's because this really should be u prime. It's a deviation variable. It starts at 5, ends at 10, so that the magnitude change is actually 5. Okay, we love step changes, and the most common thing by far is we have some dynamical system. You find the transfer function on k, there's a step change, and then you have that you have If I tell you it's a unit step change, that means m is 1. Okay, the magnitude of the step change is a unit. unit. Okay. All right. So that represents a sudden change in some input. could be due to disturbance or anything like this. Okay. And for most systems, as we're going to see, they have a the systems that we're interested in have kind of characteristic response to a, a step input. That response we use to call the step response. Okay. We'll see that in a minute. All right, so here's a ramp. Okay, it starts at zero, and then it goes up like a ramp with some slope. Slope is called A. It looks like this. Okay? So to find the Laplace transform, you have to take the Laplace transform of this, A times T. That gives you a term like A over S squared. T spawns the S squared term here, just like the constant gave you an S. Okay? So that's the Laplace transform of a ramp. We don't use a ramp a lot. The reason we don't use ramps a lot is because ramps are not bounded inputs. Right? No real input does this forever. Right? Because it just keeps going. You know, I don't know any input that goes on to infinity. <coughs> so you might use a ramp to represent something that increases linearly for some period of time. We tend not use a ramp so much. But we do keep it some. All right. Here's a common one that we use. This represents kind of a temporary disturbance. The input is zero. Then it goes up to some value h. And then at some future time, it drops back to zero. So it changed temporarily and perturbed the system and then ultimately drop back to where it began. So it looks like this. Okay, it's zero until, um, well, sorry, zero for time less than zero, then it's h between zero and this number tw, and then at time tw goes back to zero. Um, so I don't think I will derive this one, but I'll try to explain it at least. So this little plus transform of that input. Okay. So h again is the magnitude. Tw here is where the input changes back to zero. Okay. So you might ask, well, how in the world did you get that? That's not very obvious. Okay. Well, if I were to derive this, the way I would do it is I would have two inputs. I would say this input here okay, looks like two inputs added together. I mean, right, if you don't know the Laplace transform of this input, break it into the sum of two inputs you do know the Laplace transform for. So if you were to do that, um, it would look something like that. Make sure I don't screw this up. Okay, so there's input one. At time zero, it goes up to a value h. Okay, this is u1. And this term here represents the Laplace transform of that input u1. It's just a step change goes up to h and stays there. There would be a second input called u2, and it would do this. This would be minus h, and this time here would be tw. Right? If you add these two inputs together, the input stays up at h until time tw, and then you add h and minus h together, it goes to zero. So my claim is that u of t is nothing more than the sum of the u1 and u2. Hopefully you can see it at least graphically, if that's true. Okay? The first term over there is the Laplace transform of u1, which is h over s. The second term is the Laplace transform of um, the second input. Okay. It's minus h over s. Because right, its magnitude is minus h instead of plus h. And because this change occurs at tw and not time zero, we get this 
time delay thing that I tried to explain to you in the past, right? That, that we get this kind of term if something happens not at zero, but it happens sometime in the future. Okay? So that's where you get this input from. I guess I did drive it. Okay. So this, this is what Boss transform of the U1 in the second term of that U2. Okay? So we use this pretty frequently to represent an it, uh, just something that changes, but the change is not permanent. Okay, unlike the step where it's permanent. Uh, sometimes we interested in the sinusoidal input. Okay? So here you could have cosine or sine. If, let's say you have this in, input here. So it's zero, it's all time equals zero, and then it's equal to the sine. There's the amplitude, there's the frequency. Okay? Now, I should ask you this question. What do you think happens if you put a sinusoidal system signal into a dynamic system? What do you think comes out? A sinusoid, right? Um, but, so we'll see, we'll see this, I guess, in, in a minute. But if I put a sinusoidal signal into the system, I'll get some kind of sinusoidal system out. It'll be different, have a different amplitude. It'll have the same frequency, but it'll be phase shifted. Do you guys do this in like physics or somewhere? Do you like, let's do this sometime, right? All right, so um, this is the time domain function. Here's the corresponding well boss domain. I got that right out of the table. Okay. All right. So these are the main inputs that we'll be interested. There'll be others, okay? But these are kind of the main building blocks of what we're interested. In. So now we would be interested in what is the response of a first order system to each of these input changes. Um, all right. So just a little nomenclature here. Generically, this explains why I call this first order system. Generically, a transfer function, right? We've written in the past y equals g times u. I can just algebraic, so I can just divide both the equations by y. So get y, sorry, by u. y over u equals g. No big deal. And what I've written is the most general form of g that we'd ever be interested in. Some numerator polynomial over some denominator polynomial, potentially with some time delay here. And that time delay is due to transportation lag down the pipe or something like that, as I explained in the past. That's the most general being said in the whole course. Okay? So I'm telling you, a first order system looks like the ones we've already talked about. The, the numerator has no power of s, it just has a number k. The denominator is first order in s, and there's no time delay. Okay, that's as simple as it gets. That's what we call a first order system. You get a transfer function like this if you derive it from a single first order differential equation, right? like we already did. The next level of complexity, which is the next lecture, is the so-called second order system. It has a transfer function that looks like this generally. Okay? So it's second order in the numerator. Uh, that's wrong. It's first order in the numerator, second order in the denominator. Okay? So the order of the system is the order of the denominator polynomial in S. First order came from a single first order differential equation. Second order came from two coupled first order differential equations. Okay. So what we're going to do is, in this lecture, focusing explicitly on systems that look like this, which is corresponding to that stirred tank example, and then next lecture we'll focus on ones that look like this. The, the behavior of these things is a lot more diverse and interesting than these. So we'll come back to this next time. Okay. All right. So now we're interested in what the response of a first order system will be uh, look like to a step input, and then, I'll, then like to a ramp input, and then to a sinusoidal input. Okay. So this is just a, this is just a reminder. This is like remember this from five slides ago. This was what we derived for the stirred tank heater. Right? For each of the two inputs, inlet temperature and Q, there was a first order transfer function that related that input to the temperature. Okay. Now, what we don't want to do is derive what the response is for this thing and then for this thing, because these have the same form, k over tau s plus 1. Okay? So generically, I'm going to write a first order transfer function like that, k over tau s plus 1. I'm going to find out what the response is as a function of k and tau, okay? and also the magnitude of the step. And then if you have a problem that looks like this, and you know the answer for that, yeah? Previous side. 
Yeah, I'll explain. I'm glad you know what to call this. But, um, I'll explain what squiggly means in the, in the future. Yeah. So right now I'm just saying, I just gave you this slide to say, the reason we call this a first order system is because the denominator is first order in S. We'll soon be covering cases that are second order or higher in S, but we're not doing that now. Okay. And squiggly will have a physical interpretation. Okay. And I will call it squiggly, which is reassuring. All right. So we're going to write all first order systems in this form. Okay. K over tau s plus K over tau s plus one. K is a steady state gain, as I explained. Tau is the time constant. I'm going to derive, as you can see down here, what the response of any first order system is to an input change of any magnitude. Okay. And then the idea is, once you know this answer, all you have to do to use it is to know what K is for your problem. One in this case, let's say tau is for your problem, whatever this evaluates to, I'll give you rho v and w, and what the magnitude of step change, and then you already know the answer. Now that you say, so I'm finding the step response for any first order system, if you have a first order system, you just have to find the k, tau, and m for your problem, and you use the answer. Okay. Alright, so this is how we compute the response. Write y equals g times u, right? There's the transfer function, there's the input, there's the output. g is first order, so it looks like that. I'm telling you, in this case, I'm interested in the step response. The Laplace transform of step response is m over s. Okay. To find the response, I have to be able to take the inverse Laplace transform of this guy. Right, but it's directly in the table. If you look in the table, you'll see there's an entry for table 3.1. Um, so f of key. I think it's called doing something that looks like this part. Yeah, and then over here, half of that. One of the entries will be 1 over s tau s plus 1. Okay? And then over here, you'll see the corresponding entries 1 minus e to the minus t over tau. Okay, and all I'm doing is using that result. Okay. The only difference between this thing and the example I have is that I have the whole thing multiplied Km, right? So we use the answer in the table and multiply times Km. Okay. And if I do it, I get Km okay. times the answer in the table. <coughs> now, hopefully you can see here, well, let me, let me draw a picture. There's a picture up there, but let me draw a different picture of this thing. Don't forget my chalk. Look at what this looks like. I'm just plotting the solution now. Okay. Here's y prime of t. Here's t. And so what does it look like? Well, what does it start off at? Well, t, you know, e to the minus t over tau, t zero, that evaluates to one, starts at zero. Okay. Then it increases exponentially to this value k m, right? take the limit of that solution as t goes to infinity, you'll see it equals cam. Exponential time goes to zero. Okay. So it looks like this. Okay. And now you can see that the interpretation of k is the steady state gain. K told you how much the output would respond to a change in the input. The, the total change is k times m. K is the gain of the system, m is the amount of this change. Okay. So k is the steady state gain tells you how much the output will respond to the input and the actual input magnitude changes m. So the total change is k times m. Okay. This tau here tells you how fast the system will get from this point to this point. If tau is really fast, it'll look like this. Okay. If tau is really slow, it'll look like that. Okay. So this is what um, tau is getting larger from that direction. Okay. So what they've done in this plot here is to make the plot very generic. They, instead of plotting time, they've scaled time by tau. And instead of plotting y, they've scaled y by km. Okay. And then it looks like this. Okay. So again, it starts at 0 and it goes up to 1 because you've scaled by km. Okay. And what you find is you see the little dashed line here. 
it may seem weird, right? 1.63 here. So what this says is, so what does 1 represent? 1 represents when t equals tau, right? Because t over tau is 1. The output will have reached 63.2% of its final value. Okay. So this tells you that in order for a system to go from one steady state to another, you can see here, it takes about four time constants, right? Because this is one time constant, two, three. But about the time you're at four, it's about, about where it's going to go. It never actually gets there until infinity, right? But it's pretty darn close to four. So if your system has a time constant of an hour, you're going to have to wait about four hours for it to get to steady state. Okay. So I think that this problem with the distillation columns has a time constant of maybe 15, 20 minutes. So it takes about an hour, an hour and a half to get to steady state. Right. And this is a real problem if you're operating a system, right? That's something that can be a long time. All right, so that's the generic response of a first order system to an input, to a step change. And again, if you had this problem and you said, I wonder what the response, you wouldn't say this, I hope. I wonder what the response of Q, uh, the temperature is to Q. You'd say, it's that. And for my problem, that's K, and that's tau. And someone just has to tell me the magnitude of the change here, M, and I'll just use that answer. You, get it? you don't have to rewrite it, it's already done. All right, so that's pretty uh, sensible, I think. So I should probably just appeal to this for a second. So if, if you were to do that for this problem, what would you find? If you change this Ti 10 degrees, it'll, it'll go up, right? Temperature will increase, that makes sense, and it will finally go up 10 degrees. Right? Inlet temperature goes up 10 degrees, the outlet temperature will go up 10 degrees too, eventually. Okay. Uh, if you change Q prime, if you increase the amount of heat, temperature will also go up. The amount will go up depends on the, how much the fluid flow through the system is in the heat capacitor fluid. Okay. So what I want to encourage you to do is when you get in this, this Laplace world, which you're not maybe, well, you're sure you're not that familiar with it, maybe not totally comfortable with it, don't lose the interpretation of what things mean. I mean, they still mean things. It's just not just equations, okay? Um, so even though I guess you could have reasonable success just blindly manipulating equations and stuff, it would be best if you understood what the equations meant. Right. Okay. So what if we subject the system to a ramp instead of a step in? This would be less common, but you could do it. Okay. By the way, when, when it comes to note taking, since all the things are now posted and my approach, uh, I guess you guys have printer quotients or something like that. But my approach, we try to print out the notes and just make, you see what I'm saying? Just print out, try to come with the notes print and just make additional comments on the notes that are already there. I mean, you don't want to really try to draw this picture or all these equations, right? It's not necessary, so I give you the notes. So um, anyway, I don't know how the rules work. They probably don't allow you to print like one page per, per week or something like that. But, um, <laughs> All right, so we subject the first order system to a ramp now. So the first term there, right, so we have y equals g times u. g is, again, first order. The u is the ramp, a over f squared. You look at that thing, you're like, uh, whoops, that's not in the table, right? Now we have to take the inverse Laplace transform and find y of t, and that thing is not in the table. Now you can do partial fraction expansion. I just show you the answer of the partial fraction expansion. Are you going to get a term over tau s plus 1, another term over s, another term over s squared. And I found the alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3 is what we call them. That's what they are. Okay. Now you can take the inverse Laplace transform of each term, term by term. Okay. Now, so the first term yields this thing. You'll notice that it's tau there instead of tau squared because the inverse Laplace transform of something that looks like 1 over tau plus 1 is 1 over tau times that. So it cancels one of the taus. What you're going to have to do at some point is you've got to take these answers and look in the book, the table, and see exactly where they came from. For me to explain it, and you try to see how it would be kind of painful, okay? But that's where I got it from. The second thing is just something over S. We know that yields just the constant, which is minus k a tau. And then the second thing, just a constant over s squared, that yields the constant times time. Okay? So break it down into three terms. Uh, each term is in the table. All right. So if t becomes very large compared to tau, this term will decay to zero, right? It will be negligible. 
and then you can write, just gather these two terms here and write it like this. Okay. So what this is a plot of, okay, so they do different things for different slides. So this is, instead of plotting t over tau, they plot t as a, as a multiple of tau. It's basically the same thing, right? That's one tau, two tau. Okay. And then they plot, why do they do that? Because you can see t is still the color. And then they plot uh, the output over k times a. k times a is here, and then they scale the input by a. Just a convenient way to plot. It's nothing magical about it. Okay. The actual solution looks like this thing here. Well, here's what the input looks like, right? It's a ramp, and it has slope 1, because you've scaled by the, the ramp. You've scaled by the slope, so it now it's slope 1. And then the actual equation here, if you plot it, looks like this. So not surprisingly, if you put a ramp into a system, a ramp comes out. Okay. So it has a little curvature here. It doesn't exactly look like a ramp initially because of this term right here. But eventually, it looks like a ramp. That's this equation. Okay. Which is what here. So it converges to this equation as t gets larger. And so you put a ramp in, and guess what? A ramp came out. The slope is different. The slope is of the output is k times a instead of a, but it's still a ramp. So again, this is this could model something that happens temporarily, like something's increasing, like a ramp temporarily. This can't go on forever, because then the output will go to infinity. And that, that doesn't make any physical sense. We talked about. Okay, so that's the ramp. Holy smokes. Okay, there'll be a quiz on this. Now. Uh, <laughs> so this is the uh, sinusoidal response. So again, should be getting comfortable with this idea, take the transfer function, first order multiplied times the input. That's the, that's the um, Laplace transform of a sinusoidal input that was on the previous slide. Okay. Okay, guess what? That's not in the table. All right. Break it into pieces that are in the table. Okay. So that involves a term involving tau s plus one, and then this thing, let me give you one caveat. I'm not going to ask you to do this. So what are we trying to do here? Well, if I just said, there it is, and there's the answer, you'd be like, well, how in the world, right? But once these problems get sufficiently complex, it's possible I might ask you something like this in the homework, but I'm not going to ask you this on a test, right? This is the algebraic nightmare. So it would just show your ability to do algebra. But I don't want you, I don't want to just give you this and then give you this, like, don't worry about how it happens. It's all very magical. Only I know how. Okay. So you can figure out you can figure out how, and in the process you'll figure out you don't want to do it, right? All right. So we do partial fraction expansion, we get a term over tau s plus one. There's going to be another term over this thing you can't factor it. It's going to look like alpha two s plus alpha three. There's alpha two, there's alpha three. Okay. So I did the partial fraction expansion for you. Okay, and the the idea here is that each of these terms is in the table. Okay. The first term yields this against one of the tau cancels that I just explained. The second term yields this. Because there's an entry in the table that says if you have something that looks like s over s squared plus omega squared, that's cosine omega t. You just have to, you have to just look at the table and see where these things come from. Okay. The third entry is exactly a sign, and then again, we pull this whole thing. It's a constant out in front. So this is pretty messy, right? Okay, so that's a legitimate answer, but it's not the form I want. So I'm going to use um, an identity. It's, it's been several years I've been trying to find where I found this. I think it's called the Euler identity. What it does is it allows you to take two trigonometric, two trigonometric functions, cosine and sine, combine them into one trigonometric function with a phase angle. You know, you've heard this term phase angle before. Yes, no? Doesn't seem like it. Okay. All right, so what I'm doing is I'm taking these two terms that came from taking the inverse Laplace transform, and I want to combine them into one term. I'm using this equation here to do it. Okay. So you've got to trust me on this one, perhaps. Okay, so I take these two things, I combine them into this. Okay, and it ends up just phi here is inverse tangent of this. You've never seen anything like this? You've never seen... I don't know what... Of course, it's not something you cover in chemical engineering. I'm, I'm guessing you cover it in physics or something. I don't know. Um, if you take physics, um, or physics majors, they do that. Oh, okay. But it's not, uh, not for us. OK. All 
All right. Well, it's okay. I'll, I'll explain. So I started here, right, or I got here, and then I combine these two to get this, and now I'm just rewriting this equation given that I can write these two terms like this term and you get this here. It's quite, quite messy looking, right? You can see why we want you to do it. So what does this say? It says the response, so what did I do? I put a sinusoid into a system and what came out? Well, some exponential term, and then, not surprising, a, a sinusoid. You put a sinusoid in, a sinusoid comes out. All right, so if, you, if you're interested in what happens when time gets large, it's kind of like this RAM problem, right? If you looked at the RAM problem, initially there was some transient that had to do with the exponential term, and then this eventually decayed away and looked like the RAM. You do the same thing here, and are you just interested in time times t that are large relative to how this time would be negligible, and then you can just reduce it to equal in the sinusoid. Okay? All right, so this has some reasonable interpretation. So if you look, you remember the input here. That's where that a, you know, this came from a time domain function that looked like this. U of p equals a sine omega t. Okay? So it's a sinusoid. You know what that, I'm hoping you know what this means, right? This is a sinusoid function with an amplitude. You don't have to go. <laughs> exactly terrifying. Okay. <laughs> So this is a sinusoid of function with frequency omega and amplitude a. Everyone knows that. Everyone knows what this means, right? And amplitude, frequency, okay. So what came out of the system? It's a, it's a sinusoid, not surprisingly. It's got the same frequency, right, as the input. It has a different amplitude. And it's also been phase shifted. You know what I mean by phase shift is that if you were to plot these, I'm not going to be very good at plotting them. So don't hold out a lot of hope. So this might be the input, okay, look like that. And the output is going to be, let's say, phase shifted and have a different amplitude. All right, so it's not going to be in phase, like the peaks are not going to be at the same time, that's what I mean by out of phase, and it's going to have a different amplitude, okay? Now this, this comprises a huge part of, of control theory and dynamical systems theory called frequency response. When I first taught this course, and the first edition of the book you have came out, I think there was four <coughs> chapters on this. Now there's one chapter on this. Um, Professor Connor loves this, I, I have to warn you. Okay? Um, but this is, this is a nice tool, but you can only cover so much in a course. So you can do all kinds of things with this frequency response. What happens when you put a sinusoid in, what comes out? You can do modeling control based on this analysis, but we're not really focused on that. Okay. I just want to mention this whole idea forms the basis of frequency response, which is now one chapter in the book. Okay. I used to teach this, but when I talk to people, you know, if I consider who my customers are, they're not actually you, but they're the people that hire you, they're like, good, they need to know that. I mean, it'd be nice, but you can't cover it all. So if you hear the term frequency response, which you might hear it in lab, there is material in the book. This is the basis for it. I can I can talk to you about that offline. But, um, we need to do it now. All right. So now what I'm doing is doing a little example and simulate. Right? So what I've done is just made up a toy example. Okay. And today's Thursday, right? So tomorrow we're going to learn how to start using simulate. So that means when you show up tomorrow at 1010, you know, class of 1010, 1010 to 11, you should bring your laptop with, with MATLAB and simulate on it if you want to get anything out of the experience. So this is the problem I set up, just as a toy example. There is a first order system, right? It has a gain of three, it has a time constant of four. Here's my input. Okay. It has an amplitude of two, and it has a, um, well, that's not true, sorry. So this is the um, Laplace transform of an input that looks like Sorry, please entertain me while I do this. Right, okay. So I'm claiming that the time domain input here is this. Sine 2t. Okay. 
That's the Laplace transform of that. The Laplace transform <coughs> looks like f squared plus omega squared, and then the numerator is omega. Okay, so that's the input. Sine with the frequency of 2, amplitude of 1. All right, so what I've done here is I've created a simulation. I think this will be the last slide. I'll do the other one next time. So let me just open this up. I forgot what that one's called, and the, the font is so big I can't hardly manipulate it. So it's called this one. It's thinking. Okay, so as we'll learn tomorrow, how I put this thing together is I went into this block um, diagram library that MATLAB has. And I dropped these four things into this page. I open up a new page. You do it by like this. File, new, model. So it opens this thing up. Okay? As I'll show you next time, then you can open up the library. Library browser. And then you see all this stuff will appear. Right? Continuous. And you see something in there should be called the transfer function. There it is. I can't, it's hard to grab it and drop it in. But you see, then you grab the thing, hold down the cursor, drop it in there, bam, you got a transfer function. Click on it, you can enter the numerator and the denominator. So, what I've done to put this thing together, this model, wherever it went here, is I drop these four blocks in there. Next time I'll show you where, where to get these blocks. This represents the input, it's a sign, right? This represents my first order system of a game, three times on the four. And then because I want to simulate this and be able to plot the output, I write both the input and the output to the workspace, like so I can simply plot them the work or something like that. Okay. So again, the sine function, which I'll show you where to find next time, because there's lots of blocks, tells you how to use it, but it's, oh, well, I've chosen to use an amplitude of five here, apparently. Not sure why. It is a frequency of two, but it's an amplitude of five instead of one. Not sure why I did that. Uh, no, I just changed the amplitude to one. I was getting angry. Um, and there's a and there's a first order system. And so if you want to run this, it's the amount of time you want to run. You run this thing. So first of all, let me go to the workspace. If I clear this, people may can't see very well, I can't type very well. There's nothing up there. Run the simulation here. Run the game. And then you see now it's created these variables that you can plot. So you can plot like um, in, uh, T out, which is time, which is output. Jeez. Pressure. Getting to it. Okay, so the output looks like that. And then if you want to plot the input at the same time, hold the plot. 